Welcome to Mama Fuel, the podcast that fuels every mama's heart, soul, mind, and body, and hopefully sparks a few dreams along the way. I'm Ann Ferguson, Chief Nurturer and Mama Mentor at the Centered Mama Project, and your host for this podcast. I'll be sharing real, raw, and often funny conversations with beautiful mamas from around the world to remind you that you're not alone and that you're doing amazingly on this wild journey of shepherding small humans as they make their way on our beautiful planet. Let's get started. Hello, and welcome to today's episode of Mama Fuel. My name is Anne Ferguson, and I am your host. And with me today is an extraordinary lady by the name of Laura Powner. Laura and my paths have crossed in kind of distant ways in the online business space, but the place where there was the pow of Powner in my heart and head was when I saw Laura having a conversation with my mentor, Gemma Went, who was also my guest on, I don't have a list in front of me, I'm going to say episode 16 um, of Mama Fuel, where we were talking about Gemma's journey into mm-hmm. and through motherhood <laughs> to this stage where she's at now with Jack and how that affected her life and her business and so on. And Laura and Gemma had paired together at one point to offer something to we entrepreneurs, which spoke to me so much. And I thought, oh, I really, really want to have Laura on because she's so honest about her journey and so honest about how anxiety has played a role in her life, the choices that they've made with their kids. She's mama of two beautiful kids who are eight and five. They're both homeschooled. So that's a whole universe of difference. I was, we were talking before we recorded about summer holidays and that it's kind of the same as not summer holidays when you're homeschooling. So let's get into all of this and so much more. I can't wait for you to meet Laura. So welcome, Laura. Thank you for being my guest today. Thank you very much for having me. So let's start at the... I always want to sing this from The Sound of Music. Let's start at the very beginning. A very good place to start. <laughs> <laughs> when you begin, you begin with Dory Me. So let's begin with, with our version of Dory Me, which is tell us what your life looks like right now. Okay, so right now I have got it in what I like to think is the best place it has ever been. Oh, so as you said, I have my children at home 24-7 almost, <laughs> which in the beginning was a um, huge challenge, mm. huge challenge because they have been, well, Charlie, my oldest, has been to school. So to move from school to homeschool was difficult, mm. um, but we've been doing it, I think, almost three years now. I think that's right. So we've got into the swing of things. I now have um, a tutor who comes to the house and helps me with that. So the pressure of carrying it all on my shoulders has gone. Mm. Um, She comes, she does her amazing stuff. She's uh, Montessori trained. So she teaches my children in a way that they like to learn. Um, She understands their needs and meets them. It's like a match made in heaven. And we've had her almost six months now and you can see the difference in the kids. Everybody comments on it. So I'm lucky enough to have a tutor. I have just, just hired back a nanny that we used to have before we went to Australia. She's come back on board. So she helps me. So I now have help three days a week. Mm. Uh, The dream is that those three days will be the three days that I work and the other four days I won't. Mm. So the best place (laughs) I have ever been is finally where we're at now, but it's taken a long time to get there. So good. So you're a person who supports not just women, but men as well. And the way that we, one of the things that made the the kapow sort of go on and go off in me, as I was listening to you talk about Gemma, talk to Gemma, sorry. Little sleep deprived today. So everyone listening (laughs) will just have to forgive my brain and mouth not working in complete coordination. Um, Was that you were were talking about how we all have money stories and we all have Mm -hmm. stuff around money that affects our capacity to earn, whether it's in a job or whether it's Mm -hmm. in business or whatever it might be. And it also affects our relationships with each other. But it all stems from... Our relationships with ourselves. Exactly. <laughs> the one thing that nobody wants to hear in the beginning. So we talk about it from perspective of we're going to look at money, but the reality is money is an outside 
currency for what's going on inside. And so you know this, work. you know this because you have trodden this path with all of its bumps and bruises and highs and lows. And you were trotting that path at the same time as you were entering into and experiencing all of the highs and lows and twists and turns and bumps and and delights and amazements of being a mama, right? Can you talk to us a little bit about your journey into becoming a mama and what that has brought into your life? So my background is I have spent 18, almost 19 years as a chartered accountant. So my dream when I, I didn't go to university, I went straight to work. I knew accounting was what I wanted to do. I did some work experience and I thought, yep, working in an office, that's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> going to see lots of clients, that's even better. And working with loads of people who are quite fun for accountants, why not? <laughs> picked, picked Caveat. Yeah. <laughs> I love, all, I, I know a lot of accountants who I love deeply, so yeah. Yeah, they're not as boring as you think. Um, I married one, so... They can't be that bad. But yeah, so I spent 18 years in this world of accounting. And my dream in the beginning was to be a partner in a firm. And then the closer I got to that, and I got, you know, on the, the route to become that, I thought, mm, do I? Do I really want that? I'm not sure. Um, and then met a client who forever changed the path that I took. And I ended up going to work there and decided that I no longer wanted to be a partner. I wanted to be a finance director. So get going with that and then I got married and I have known since I was probably five that I wanted to be a mum always always wanted that Mm. um but for me my first child almost was this business that I went to be finance director of because it was in terrible shape it was going down swanee and it was my job to fix it and save it Mm. and I did that but the love that I poured into doing that and the hours and the sweat and the tears, it became like my child. So it meant awful lot to me at the time. And anyway, I got married and um, I'd always wanted children. And my mum had said, you know, it took her 10 years to have me. So she'd kind of always fed me this story that, you know, it might be really difficult for me to have a child. It might take forever in a, a day. Mm. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, you know, I really want to get on with this. I don't want to, what if that happens to me? I don't want to take ages and ages. So I got married um, and literally I was pregnant at my wedding. I just didn't know. (laughs) (laughs) I didn't know then. Efficient, highly efficient. Yeah, we thought it it could take 10 years or longer or it might be a problem because of everything my mum had fed me about her stories. So um, anyway, it was like, well, we're going to get married. Let's start really fast. And we did. And (laughs) I was pregnant at my wedding. So then I was in this situation where I'd, you know, I've been turning this business around. I absolutely loved it. And now I was pregnant and I'd only just got there. So there was no way I was going to be able to go on maternity. There was no way I was going to be able to leave it because it wouldn't survive if I left. Um, so I was like, oh God. So the, the excitement and the joy of finally going to be, a, you know, be a mother, which I had wanted for all those years, was marred by the fact by being a mother, I now can't turn up and do this role that I was doing now I've got a problem so being the people pleaser that I was at the time I didn't want to let the people that I was working down with so I said don't worry I will work right up until the minute I have Charlie and I'll be back two months three months into it no problem so that's exactly what I did I went to work the day before I had him (laughs) I had him and I was answering emails the night of his birth and I was back to work 12 weeks later, but I'd been in and out before then, but I was back to work properly. But taking him to a childminder killed me. Mm. Leaving my tiny, tiny 12-week-old baby with somebody that I barely knew. she has got great recommendations and lots of other people knew, but I didn't know her. Mm. With my son was a killer and I hated it. And I hated it so much. There were not enough words to tell you how much that killed me. It was awful. It was a constant... Um, source of pain for me mm-hmm. every time I left him to go to work it was just like why am I even doing this so anyway that's how it was and um, it got to a point where my mum offered to come and help so she would have him two days a week and I managed to work the third day at home and then I was with him the rest of the time so I'd managed to get it to a really good point but I still felt that awful guilt mm-hmm. that awful guilt that I'd been leaving him um, and then you know a couple of years passed 
and I got pregnant with Chloe and I decided there was no way on this planet I was going to repeat what I'd done with Charlie. I just couldn't do it again. So I would need to be off this time. And it just so happened that um, the timing all fell right. And I managed to sell the company that was kind of my first child. Mm. When she was eight weeks, um, maybe took me six weeks for the whole process. And then that was it. I was done. No more having to go to work. No more having to leave my babies. I was at home. However, <laughs> all of a sudden you were at home. <laughs> yeah, little did I know that being at home 24 7 was never, ever going to work for me. Mm. That I needed something more than that. I didn't want to have to go out and leave them, but I needed something to stimulate my brain mm-hmm. more than just, you know, feeding and what we're going to have for tea. And, you know, it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. And I could, it, it just felt like my brain was turning into something that I didn't recognize Mm -hmm. I needed something outside so I was trying to work out what was I going to do to be able to stay at home with my babies but to make the money that I needed to have so I did what I (laughs) knew and set up an accounting practice because that's what I'd been doing for all of those years before Mm. Um, and that's what I did and that's what enabled me to get the life that I currently have now Um, it allowed me to retire my husband and we've had you know, a real great time out of it, but it's not work that I love anymore. And so the accounting has been left (laughs) to the side and I am focusing on people's relationships with money, people's relationship with themselves, their money mindset, their money strategy and things like that. And now I am much, much happier and I have this perfect balance. Mm, (laughs) And the people that you love are around you and you can see them and also you get you've created that space and those boundaries that say, this is where I go to feed my brain and I go to work out my brain and connect with people in a different way beyond being mummy, being yes. and all of me. And my children see me go to work and not necessarily leave the house. Sometimes I leave, sometimes I'm doing it here. But for them, they don't see mummy going to work as a problem. Mummy loves to work. Yeah, it's it's a you know work's a great thing. They don't have a thing about work being a oh it's a you know it's an awful thing when we we thrive for the weekends. They yeah. know I love what I do, so they love seeing it, which is which is amazing as a as a gift to them, right? That they get to see you flourishing in the process of of working in this way that you have finally come to that's the right balance for you but it wasn't so easy to I mean you sort of skipped over some bits wasn't so easy for you to get to that stage of doing what you love and having the right balance and one another thing that that really drew me to invite you on to the podcast was that there was a a a while a few months ago at time of recording um, where it was mental health week mental health awareness week in the UK and you posted an incredibly honest post about anxiety and your dance with that mental illness, which I also live with, not daily, the sort of underlying thrum is there yeah. all the time. The thrum is, the, the, the groove is so deep that before we had this conversation, I went and literally lay in my bed and thought, right, I just need a 10 minute lie down just to, just to fuel myself up, just to take some time because sleep deprived. and. It was what the, what that did was put me right in touch with that underlying thrum of anxiety, but all the things that mm. that were going on. So I have that you know that shared experience, and also the peaks of such of panic attacks and of such paralyzing anxiety that actually even the room that I'm in is too big and everything needs to be small, and I'm pretty sure I'm about to die because of the anxiety. And I know that that's something that you have lived. So can you, are you willing to talk a little bit about, about your journey? Because mine was directly, directly linked to post-traumatic stress mm-hmm. caused by a gynecological surgery when I was 13 that I never processed until I had my first child with a surgery that resembled the first gynecological surgery. Except this time, instead of taking something out, they gave me a baby, which was great. But with her came this crash I crashed I literally Mm -hmm. crashed and so you with your second birth I think yeah it was a second so there was there was um snippets of panic attacks when I was pregnant with Charlie so at the time 
I was like, what? You know, I couldn't understand. If you've never had a panic attack, the first time you have it, it's like, what, what is happening to me? Mm-hmm. And I remember sitting in a meeting and, and there was, it was in a work meeting. It was pretty, you know, I, I was negotiating <laughs> million dollar deals and um, the fact that we couldn't make payroll and all of these stressful things. None of that triggered anything. No anxiety, no panic around any of that. I could do that. That didn't stress me out. And one day we were sat in a meeting and I wasn't, I wasn't presenting. I wasn't doing anything. I was just listening. And I could feel what is now familiar that fear bubbling up mm-hmm. and I remember thinking oh my god I, I'm having a heart attack mm-hmm. am I going to be sick am I going to faint what is happening to me and you know obviously didn't want to express this in, in, to anybody was afraid to stand up and leave the room because I thought I might fall down yeah. so yeah. just sort of sat and thought what is this and then it passed you know as fast as it came it passed and that maybe happened two or three times while I was pregnant with Charlie and then I didn't really think anything of it I just assumed it's hormones, it's just pregnant people. That's what happens. <laughs> End of that. Carry on powering through your career, woman. Off you go. So parked it. And then it didn't happen when really once when I was pregnant with Chloe. It happened again in a restaurant. And so again, I was like, here we go. It's that, it's a pregnancy thing. Then <laughs> having given birth, um, eight weeks later, Chloe had um, reflux, but we didn't know it at the time. So she was just, you know, she would, she would be there, there in a car or we were holding her and all of a sudden she'd sort of look like she was choking. Mm. So you'd sit her up and pat her back and it would go. And then one day I was just me and the children. So Charlie was there, he was maybe two and a half. And I, I was, we were in the lounge and I was doing something on the floor with Charlie and she was in a Moses basket and I could hear something. I thought that, what, what is that sound? Looked into her basket and could see her literally struggling to get the air in. So I whipped her up and was like, pat, 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 pat. And this time I couldn't stop it. No matter, no amount of patting or rubbing or, you know, it was getting rid of it. She couldn't breathe and she was going blue. Mm. And I was thinking, oh my God, you know, what am I, what do I do? What do I do? And I'm like, Charlie stay in the lounge and I took her in the kitchen because I thought I don't want him to see this, this is not nice. And I phoned 999 because I didn't know what else to do. Um, and they were talking to me all the time. And she was, saying, she was saying, the ambulance responder's coming. We'll be there before the ambulance. There'll be just be a minute. Don't, you know, it's going to be fine. It's just going to be a minute. And I could hear the echo of their mics to each other. And she was saying, get the defib, get the defib, get the defib. And I'm thinking, oh my God, she's dying. And they're waiting to, you know, resuscitate her. And I didn't know what to do. And then all of a sudden, she was completely blue, not making a sound. This massive ball of bloody mucus came out of her mouth and blood started pouring out of her nose, but she breathed. Oh, God. And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> and the ambulance responder flew through the door. And I said, this has just come out, but she's okay now. And they looked at her and her heart rate was up and everything because she'd been yeah. panicking too, but she was fine. So off we went to hospital, no problem. And then she did it again in the hospital. And that's when they identified that she'd got reflux. So she'd also got mucus stuck because her, her labor had been really fast. So that was just that coming out, but she'd got reflux and it was that in her throat. Burning. It was making it difficult. So she went on medication for that and that was the end of that. However, I had held on to what felt like my baby girl dying mm-hmm. and I could not let go of that feeling because I didn't know what to do. <laughs> didn't, I was helpless. And the trauma of that is still with me today, mm-hmm. but it's more processed now than it ever was. Um, and that sort of fear, just that I couldn't control life. I, my job was to be their mom and to protect my children. And whilst, you know, there's things that we can do to protect them, I cannot swear <laughs> that I can keep them alive or that I will stay alive for them. And this, this realization that we have zero control over life was epic and affected me hugely. Mm -hmm. And literally from around about a week after that event, and my grandma then died and she was the woman that I would talk to about everything. I would tell her everything that I dreamed of and she would never say, don't be so ridiculous she would just listen and say, you could tell even when she thought, what are you on about? She would still say, sounds lovely, darling. And, she would still say that. and I lost that at around about the same time. Um, and that was really difficult. And then obviously I was selling the company that had been almost my first child. Mm. So there was a whole period of loss 
and trauma all together. And then this anxiety just kicked in that constantly I was aware that I couldn't control life, that I couldn't stop them getting sick, that I couldn't stop things happening that were outside of my control. Things would happen all the time. And this fear began. And um, I remember the the panic attacks I'd experienced before were mild. The first one, I was like, I have, I have to leave this building. I can't, I cannot get any air in. Mm. I remember bursting out onto the drive and just being like, <sighs> and then I could breathe. And then I was like, now what do I do? And so I used to just go outside and then I'd go and drive and then I'd come home. Um, and then it became part of me and it happened daily, sometimes more than once a day. And it went on for years. Wow. And I didn't really tell anybody. I remember vaguely saying something to my parents and my dad said something along the lines of, my God, you're like that man. I've forgotten his name. I think he said Howard Hughes, who used to lock himself away and not deal with anything and kind of was taking, kind of making fun of me. Mm. And I don't think he realized at the time what he was doing. And he mentioned it after he read that same post that you referred to and said, oh my God, I think that's what I said to you. I had no idea that's what that's what you were dealing with and I said I know you didn't nobody did um I didn't tell anyone because I was afraid that they would say there was something you know mentally she's not capable of looking after her children we'll take them away Mm -hmm. you know and I didn't want any of that I was perfectly capable of living a life but I didn't I thought if anyone looked inside they would see that I was broken Mm -hmm. and that how could I be a parent to these amazing children so I just got on with it, but it would come every day. And I remember sometimes getting to the end of the day and being like, it's not happened yet. It's not happened yet. I wonder, I wonder if today will be the day. And then, you know, it would come and it was years, years of that. Um, and I don't go to anybody in person and I don't tell anyone in person. Um, and I remember looking, as you know, we work online. I remember finding people online and talking to them and just being making a huge conscious effort to eat the right foods, to drink the right drinks. I didn't drink alcohol. I didn't eat sugar. Mm -hmm. Um, I exercised. I meditated. I did it all. And still, it was there. And I was just, I remember thinking, this is it for me. This will be my life forever now. And it meant that your world got really small, Small. didn't it? Because leaving the house, I also stopped eating all I and I live in Switzerland and chocolate is the 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 gross national consumption of (laughs) chocolate is (laughs) epic and I was a healthy contributor to that you know gross national consumption I I was I was in there you know being as Swiss as more Swiss than the Swiss with chocolate (laughs) I stopped eating chocolate I stopped eating sugar I didn't touch a drop of alcohol I was never a drinker but I never touched a drop of alcohol like not even a sip of wine I couldn't have tea. Mm. Tea was too stimulating to my system and would, yeah, would trigger too. my heart would start yeah. to go. And as soon as my heart would start to increase my bowels, this is too at TMI, yeah. but it's what happens. Your no, heart rate too. starts to increase and then your bowels go and you think, oh my God, here, here we go. And you go to the loo and you think if I can just not faint on the yeah. toilet, because that's something that happens to me. And I find myself on the floor of the bathroom. It's never very enjoyable, usually painful. Um, later, I wake up later. And, and having that, that the, the, the reduction, like these are the things that I feel like are in my control. I can stop consuming these things. I can yeah. stop getting on public transportation because every time I get on public transportation, the fear starts to come up. I get dizzy. I feel the ringing in my ears and my heart you know, I get sweaty palms and I think this is it. I need to get off and I can't. Or there are people arguing. If you can't get out, Mm -hmm. then you can't go there. (laughs) Movie theater. Whenever I want. No. Yeah. And not long after these started kicking in for me, there was the the terrorist attack at the Bataclan. Mm -hmm. And after that attack in Paris, I mean, it's Paris. I'm in Geneva. It's not the same place. Mm -hmm. But I, the thought of going to a concert Mm-hmm. or going to the cinema. Mm-hmm. Even still, we were in Spain at Christmas. So this is four years on. Yeah, four years on. I still get to a cinema, got to a cinema at Christmas and was checking the exits and needed to know how I would get my kids out and what I, and, it, and it's, it's so familiar 
that instead of fighting it, now I just, I know what happens. So I just do it. And then I, sometimes I feel the heart starting to flutter and think, yeah, I know. And we're okay. Like, we're just going to be here in the theater because whether we expand all of this energy trying to control all of the things we can't control or not, the things are going to happen, right? Like you couldn't, for what, what, I mean, what a, what a crash for someone who you were such a powerful type A career in control woman to suddenly be holding one of the two most precious beings in the entire universe for you. And you could do nothing. It doesn't matter that medicine has, has moved on. It doesn't matter that you can dial 999. She's still blue. Right. Yeah. And you're still holding her. And they're not coming fast enough. And they're, yeah, <laughs> they don't live in your living room. And that's now a problem, right? Because yeah. you need their, their emergency service to be operational from your living room and go with you everywhere you go all the time. Yes. Like planes. We're no about to get way. on a plane. No way. And I think in the next, so at time of recording, my girls and I are taking three five flights between now and the end of summer. Two of them are international. And not so long ago, that would have been absolutely impossible. And I still check myself. Like I still, I'm getting on a plane. I'm taking my Jack Cornfield meditations with me. I'm taking my pocket potions that our friend Karen has created so that I have my comfort blanket to just calm myself. There are, there, those are the, the tiny details that I, that give me some semblance of reassurance of control. The reality is I'm getting on a plane. And if one of the five of them, something's going to happen, it's going to happen whether I have a pocket potion with me or not and whether I worry about it or not and whether I, my kids are with me or not. So that was, I mean, we've, we've, talked a little bit about this and you had mentioned it in your post that simple things like going out for a meal. I didn't. I just impossible. Couldn't, could not. Couldn't do it. Couldn't go for a meal. I don't think I went out for and when I said Charlie was at school obviously for a year um, and preschool. So I would have to go to take him there mm-hmm. and I would have to go and pick him up. But the number of times I had to, you know, go half an hour before because I knew I'd have a panic attack and I'd be late. It was insane. Um, so I could do that. But to go to a friend's house, no, thank you. They could come here at a push, but I would have to literally disinfect everything after they'd gone because what if they'd brought a German? I couldn't go for a meal because God knows who'd cooked it. What if they hadn't cooked it right? What if it was off? What if it was going to make me sick? What if it was going to make the kids sick? I couldn't get on a plane. I couldn't do anything mm-hmm. I couldn't even go to the supermarket sometimes I would go there to get uh, I would do my best to get Matt to do it for me that's my husband sometimes you know I'd have to go and get something and I would get there and I would walk inside I'd pick up the thing and I'd go to the the checkout and the fact I had to stand in line and there would somebody be in front of me and somebody behind me mm-hmm. I just couldn't do it because I felt trapped and I'd have to leave the thing and just just go mm-hmm. so I'd come back from the supermarket with nothing mm-hmm. And it was like, what is this? How have I gone from being, like you said, this powerhouse who was running an international group, who was making decisions that affected people every minute of the day to a woman who cannot even put food on the table because she can't go and buy it. I can earn the money for it, but I can't, can't go and buy the food for us to eat. It was insane, insane. And like you said, I couldn't get to cinema I went to the cinema. If I went, I had to sit right on the edge. No way could I sit in the middle. And even then, it wasn't a dead set. I'd be able to stay the whole time. Mm-hmm. Could have been too much. I could have. I could be a really good MI5 agent, I'm sure. Because yeah. like you said, we know all the exits. We know all the entrances. We know who's coming. We know what they're doing. We know what they're carrying. I was so hyper aware of everything. It was exhausting. Yeah. Exhausting. And that is something that I, you know, part of the reason that I am exhausted today in full disclosure is because we're about to go on the seven week trip, um, of which five are without my husband. So he'll be home, um, on and off and we will be away. We'll be with family. We'll be with my brother and sister-in-law and their kids. And we're looking forward to that. And we'll be with my mom and we're looking forward to that. And we'll be having a family reunion, which we haven't had in 30 years. And we're looking Mm -hmm. forward to that. Like Mm -hmm. it's all good stuff, right? But I'm going to New York City with my girls alone. And what if something happens to me? Mm -hmm. So 
I'm going to give them a list of phone numbers that they can call if anything mm-hmm. happens because I am the only, it's that thing of you're the only adult and yeah, it doesn't make it more or less likely to happen at all, but it, it's the thing that takes the edge off. This is, this is so scary. This is so terrifying. This, this knowledge that we are frail and that things are beyond our control. And for me, the thing that, that really sparked it, and I've mentioned it a few times, is that I had food poisoning and I was under such stress generally that mm. my body had no bandwidth. And instead of having just, you know, run of the mill food poisoning, I ended up in, in intensive care. And the doctor said, we don't, there's nothing else we can do. So we just mm. have to see how your organs react because this is it. We're at the end of the road. And to know that you have a husband on a different continent trying to fly home as fast as possible, your family's on a different continent, ever, like, it's just me and the kids. And suddenly you think, oh my, you you just come really sharply face to face with your mortality and, and their mortality. Like it's, Mm -hmm. and, and, and then you either are Zen and accept it, which is not yet my situation, or you can do all kinds of things. But in my case, and it sounds like in yours, we, we go, we have gone into moments of absolute and utter hyperdrive because we think that we, it's, we take so seriously and utterly completely our role of being mama who can keep them safe and help them have the best start in life and keep ourselves safe that we exhaust ourselves. And that's one of the reasons, and this is always a sign for me, when what comes out of my mouth is not at all what was in my head. I used to be worried that it was early onset Alzheimer's, but now I know it's just exhaustion. Just, yeah. it's, it's, not a, it's not a small thing. It's significant and has big ramifications, but but it's exhaustion because of hyper-awareness. And so in your case, what you had initially put down to hormones, and then you had this trauma of Mm -hmm. holding your baby as she turned blue, Mm. then kicks off all of these panic attacks and you chalk it up to that. But now we're five years on and you look back and think, actually... (laughs) Maybe there was more going on. So what yeah. what was what was up? For sure. And you know, at the time I remember people saying to me, Well, what are you not listening to? What are you avoiding? And I'm like, nothing. None of that none of that is occurring here. I can't explain to you where it's coming from. Just help me fix it. And nobody could help me do that. Mm. So I realized that I needed to stop talking about it and start doing the only way to get past it was to do the things I was afraid of so talking about planes I jumped on the plane and went to Australia couldn't get much further away I've been out for nearly three years (laughs) and I put everybody on a plane to Australia and off we went how was that awful in terms of getting there because we went to Dublin and then the next day we headed off to Dubai and then on to Perth and I don't think I ate for two days because I couldn't make it I couldn't prepare it and God knows, you know, what if it wasn't safe? So I didn't eat for two days. So by the time I got to Perth, I was just like, I need some food. <laughs> I really need to eat something. And I did have a panic attack on the plane, but I think that was more to do with the fact I started shaking from lack of food and sugar and everything else. Um, but, I, you know, as you know, they start and it's awful at the time, but they always finish. The end. Mm-hmm. They always stop. Always. And it stopped. And we touched down in Perth and I was determined, right, I'm in the new country, the old me, no more of that. Didn't quite pan out just like that. But um, That's a really more, tall order as well. Yeah, it was. Yeah. The more, everything there was new. I didn't know anyone. I didn't know any of the places. I didn't know the cars. I didn't know the houses. I didn't know the shops. I didn't know anything. It was all new. So for the first week, it was exhausting because everything was a fear for me, everything. But I just kept pushing and I just kept going and I would drive the car on my own. I hadn't done that for years. I hadn't been anywhere alone for a long time. And I would go out and drive the car and I would go on the beach. And it was kind of a gentle introduction because it's safe, it's open, nobody's breathing on me. I'm not going to catch a germ there. But it was getting back into society. And it was like, "Mm, this is okay. Still couldn't cope with the shopping centres. That would still cause panic. Um, but I was doing all the other stuff and slowly but surely the more I pushed the more I got used to it Um, but yeah like you said we were now five years on from that probably how do I feel now what was going on then was sometimes when I was out and about and having these panic attacks it wasn't me 
I realize now I was picking up on other people in the room. So I could feel other people. I could hear other people's thoughts. I could just feel what was going on around me in a way that I hadn't been able to do pre-Chloe. It was, she was born and something opened up. Hmm. And I was completely 100% uncomfortable with it. Didn't like it, didn't understand it, and certainly didn't want it. So I was desperately, you know, trying to close it off because I had enough going on right now. (laughs) Didn't Mm. didn't need to be dealing with this as well. Mm -hmm. Now I realise that around about that time, this is 2012, there was a huge awakening going on around the world anyway. And that was my awakening. And I don't think I'm only going to have one. I think there are going to be more. I've just been through something recently. But back then was really my opening up to the fact that I have a gift (laughs) that I didn't want. (laughs) Mm. So reading people is great. It was very useful for me at work. Didn't understand I had it, just knew that I could do it. I could, you know, I could tell you how things were going to play out. I could tell you what decisions were going to get made. I could tell you what their play would be in negotiations. Handy. I thought I was just you know, good at what I did. (laughs) Mm. Now I know I was reading it, but not to the same level as I can now. Now, you know, I can hone in on all sorts that I would never have been able to do. I can feel things. I can help people move stuff and change their energy just by sitting with them. Um, And that was all new. And I think part of my anxiety was waking up to that, but being 100% uncomfortable with it. Yeah, because I would imagine, I mean, as you say that, uh, all I can think is holy overwhelm. If you're, if you are receiving, I think about, and this is a a, quite a pedestrian example, but if, if you go to a different country where people speak a language that is completely different, like say you go to China and you're surrounded by people who speak only Mandarin, Mm -hmm. a lot of them, and they're moving in the way that people move locally to get things done at the pace that they move. It's, again, probably different if you go to, I don't know, Tanzania and you're in a large community in Tanzania and people are speaking the language that they speak there and, and moving at the pace they move and doing the things they do. It, it's, it's exhausting to be somewhere new, even if you don't have the challenge of anxiety because it's just a lot of stimulation. Just like little kids, they come home at the end of a school day and they melt down because it's too much stimulation for them and it's too much containing themselves and it's too much trying to understand and too much trying to follow the rules. And so if you're in, suddenly you have these these channels that have opened where you are receiving information you didn't ask for. It's like a whole bunch of people coming, standing around you, speaking to you in a language you don't understand constantly, loudly, a lot of them. And you're just trying to get on with getting on. I'm not surprised at your, your um, resistance. Yeah. <laughs> or your... And reluctance <laughs> and just yes. take it away. Yeah. I don't want this. I don't want this. Except it um, hasn't gone away. And you're now in this really chilled place as a human being mm-hmm. and as a businesswoman and as a mama, I get the sense. Absolutely. So there are moments in my mind where it's, you know, Chloe's got asthma now. Um, she had pneumonia and um, it's left her, her lungs are a little bit weaker and so she's got asthma. So there are moments, you know, if she can't breathe, obviously I go back to yeah. that space of, oh my gosh, I can't. Not again. Vapor kind of thing, but never to the same level. We were, we were in an ambulance only, I don't know, June, early June, but I didn't lose it. I didn't have a panic attack. I didn't lose it. I just was there as her source of support. And I could do that. And I honestly didn't think five years ago I would ever be that woman. Um, Why? Because I now don't resist. (laughs) I don't resist what I know to be true. So um, I was trying to, back at that time, I was trying to find, you know, a way to make money so I could be with the children. I was doing work that I'd always known about that I didn't love. I was trying to do things that just didn't make me feel good. And my body was trying to tell me, this isn't what you need to be doing. You know, this isn't where you need to be going. But I didn't want to hear that. 
I didn't want any of that. <laughs> I wanted to do what I wanted to do. And why wouldn't it let me do that? Um, and for me, my anxiety has calmed down and it's not here in the same way that it ever was when I listen. Hmm. And we were talking earlier about, you know, listening. Sometimes we don't want to listen because Mm-mm. we don't want to hear what needs to be said. Um, but the more I do it, the less resistant I am to it. And the more that I think now I just accept things. It, it is what it is. Um, and I might want something different, but I realize that what I'm getting will be better for me than what I could have seen. Um, like I said, you know, I don't, for work now, I can't, I cannot do what I don't love. I can't do it. And I used to try until my body would tell me I couldn't do it. Now I already know and I listen to that. So I don't force my body to do anything. I often have said when I'm teaching yoga that the body whispers and gives us a chance to listen. And if we don't listen, she speaks. And if we still don't listen, she shouts. And if like me, when I was pre- food poisoning. I was ironically teaching yoga, driving all around the city, building a house, etc. She will stop you in your tracks and it might get to the point where it's actually fatal. Like it's, it's to that point where your body says, you need to listen to me absolutely right this second because there, I have no, I have nothing left to give. Yes. And I'm curious if that is something that you see in the people that you work with, because obviously as you can pick up on and see the underlying state of affairs that they're not there to talk to you about. Yeah. <laughs> you know, as yeah. with yoga, people come to yoga because they want a tight arse, not because mm-hmm. they want to you know, face into their own inner crap or their inner state, I should say, not crap, their inner state. <laughs> um, they don't usually come at it for the philosophy or come at it for the meditation or come at it for, for that. They come at it because they want to feel good. Yeah. And I imagine that people have come to you because they're struggling to earn the money they need to earn or they're always in debt or whatever. It's something, some story. Absolutely. Choose it, it your own adventure end. around money. Yeah. It can be people who can't make it. It's people who can make it, but they can't keep it. It's people who are desperately trying to fill something with it, but it's not working and they can't comprehend why, you know, 20 cars and all of the houses, why don't I feel good yet? What is going on? Um, like we said at the very beginning, money is, you know, it's, it's an external thing that reflects what is happening internally. Um, and the reasons and the stories that everybody has are different, but the reality is, what do we do in the work together? It used to be for me very much, we focus on a strategy. Mm. I had to be there to keep delivering it. When I take, if I'm not delivering it and they're not doing the inner work, it's not changing. Nothing happened. It took me a long time to realize that I don't want to be there and having to keep digging them out of these holes. If I just did the inner work the first time, we wouldn't need to. So um, I do the inner work with them. (laughs) And it's maybe not marketed in that way because nobody wants to sign up for that. But the reality is we will change the exterior relationship with money and what they see will change as we work on who they are and why they feel the way they do about money, which we know is just energy. Just, it's just a label for energy. Yeah. And it's, we, we all have money stories, right? We all have, we, uh, we all have stories about all kinds of things. I was listening this morning to an interview that Oprah did with one of the founders of the Omega Center. I can't remember her name right now. And um, it's on the Super Soul Sunday podcast if you mm-hmm. want to go listen to it. And so one of the founders of the Omega Center in the US, which is this you know, mecca of, of learning and of, of self-exploration and of deepening your relationship with yourself and with spirit and with you know, soul yeah. and God, whatever you want to call it. And she was saying that she had been on this journey with her sister um, who developed a very rare form of, of leukemia and the only way of helping her heal was for her to have a bone marrow transplant. And the person who was a match was this woman speaking to Oprah. And she said that they had, they went through this, she, she's very, she was always the kind of airy fairy esoteric 
weirdo, as she explained, mm-hmm. she, she described it was her words. She was the weird one. And she said to her sister that she, she had gone through this whole process of cleansing herself as much as she possibly could because she didn't want to give herself to her sister yeah. with, with, with the wrong energy. And so yeah. she asked her sister to, to, if she would participate with her in a, a session where they could heal old wounds. And so they went and sat with someone who took them through their relationship as sisters. Cause when you're siblings, you've got, you know, just like when your parents and kids, you've got stuff like we all have kids, things about our parents and our kids have things with each other and with us. And it's, it's just relationships and stories we make up. And she was talking about how, as they went through this process from infancy up to the time but just before the surgery, the time of the surgery, they healed so many things. And what she said, what I kept saying was, I didn't mean that. Mm-hmm. That's, not what, that's not what I wanted to do. I'm sorry. I love you. And she said what came out of that process was that they realized that they both held stories that they had, their interpretation of, of situations became stories that they clung to as fact, which then affected their relationships with each other. And it's the same thing with money. Absolutely. The same thing with our partner, if we have one. It's the same thing with our kids. We, we pick stuff up from the minute we're born. We can hear yeah. a conversation that we misunderstand because we might be hearing it when we're two and we process it how we think we've heard it and we still make decisions of it now as adults. And yeah. it was misinterpreted back <laughs> 34 years ago in my case. It yeah. was a long time ago, but we don't, we never look at it. Because we're just so busy getting on and thinking that, you know, we just got to do the right things and we just need to do our bank recs and we just need to do our spreadsheets and we just need to do our forecasts. It's not what you need to do. You need to do those things alongside all of the inner work. And it's yeah. all about, which is kind of what I did with anxiety, undoing what we have taught ourselves to believe. Yeah. I taught myself that there was danger everywhere. I had to unteach that. Yeah. And it's something that I also, that, that sense that there's danger everywhere is something that unfortunately, because my kids were four and six at the time of this food poisoning, Mm -hmm. um, just about, they were just shy of four and just shy of six. Yeah. They have internalized a lot of that. So they became really careful and wanted to be guardians of Mm -hmm. mummy. So every time I ate one of the, you know, seven things on the list of thou shalt not touch for fear of death, instant death, they were, they were monitoring all the time and that's something they took on. And so now my little one who is probably quite similar to you, I would imagine that she probably picks up and reads and feels a lot of things from a lot of people. She has internalized that as hers. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, looking at being aware that we all have picked stuff up from a very young age as a mother, I look back and I find it really painful to look at my kids and think, Oh gosh, I've stuffed it up in this way. Or, Oh gosh, I've given them this story or, Oh, you know, and so I, I'm very careful. And again, it's this control freakiness. I'm so careful about how I say things and how I position things. And if I'm speaking to my husband and I think maybe they can hear me, I'm like constantly aware of that. And then sometimes conversely, completely lose my noodle in a not <laughs> calm, helpful, or kind, gentle way. And, and I know it's leaving, it's leaving marks. And so knowing that it's possible to, to lift the veil, this was one of the quotes that um, I cannot, it, I want to say it was Hafiz, I think it was. And I think the sentence is something like, and I was totally walking the dog and not thinking about our conversation when I was listening to this, so <laughs> forgive the butchering of this, of this quote. But it was something about, um, about the lifting of the veils, that life is, mm-hmm. that the meaning of life is just the, the lifting of the, I'm going to, so butchering it, I'm going to look it up and put it in the show notes. But she, and this woman said to Oprah, I actually think that everything you need to know about life is in that one sentence, that it's just about, lifting of the veils and with every story that we're able to shed we're lifting another layer and so you know your kids overhear something you overheard something when you were two and you misunderstood it veil you have an argument with your sibling veil you have panic attacks veil 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 you have this this, yes this is the thing and this is what i do every client comes to me with this you know i've got this belief and this belief and this belief and no that won't happen we can put down those stories yes anytime we want yes we can rewrite a new story yeah. Any minute of any day, we can make that choice. Yeah. And it's, it's about choice. It's about choice and it's about, about trust. Yes. That who we are without that story is someone who 
is worthy of being here and mm-hmm. is worthy of love and will still get things done even without that story that you're crap with money or even without that story that you're a victim of something or other or that you're a bully or that, you know, whatever the things are that people said of you and to you when you were small and even growing up. There's a, I, I had a boss who once said to me, I was 30 in London and she said to me, I don't know what it is about you. You're a bit like oil and water. There's some people who think you walk on water and some people who think you're an absolute waste of space. Don't know what it is about you. (sighs) And she left that with me. And, you know, 14 years later, I can can say it now, Mm -hmm. obviously in a very public forum. (laughs) Yeah. Very public forum. But but those, those... that still jangles. That's still something yeah. that catches. And probably I imagine when I said it, you could probably feel the catching in the, mm-hmm. in the throat of it because it's a veil that is still Absolutely. there and that I am pretty damn ready to let go. But there's that, but what if she's right? Mm-hmm. And we all, if it comes from an external source and we attribute it to someone outside, we all, I think, have that sense of, but what if they're right? What mm-hmm. if it's true? Mm-hmm. But what if it's not? Yeah, what if it's not? What if what everybody else has seen and said has nothing to do with you? Mm-hmm. Oh, wait. oh, wait a minute. That's right. <laughs> That's what it is. Yeah. And it's, it's, we need to go back. You know, we're so connected on social media. You know, you're where you are, I'm where I, and here we are looking at each other. Yeah. We've got this ability to connect with everyone, and yet we've shut off the ability to connect to ourselves yeah, because it's uncomfortable because it doesn't feel good because it brings up concerns and worries. If we just sit with ourselves and I'm never going to stop saying this for 10 minutes a day and you do it consistently, you cannot not feel better. Hmm. You can't not, but you have to take the time to be with you because I have spent so long giving to all the people around me, to my children. And the longest and hardest lesson has been, I need to be in my to-do list. At the top. When you're the top. (laughs) And for me, I've always said, I don't know how to, I don't know how to love myself. I don't know how to make myself first. I don't know how to do any of that. And the reality was, it, it was a story, a veil, an excuse. I just need to sit with myself. 10 minutes a day if that's all I can do every day without ever wiping aside that appointment yeah we all need to start there connect to ourselves Mm, I love that and it brings us seamlessly to my last question which is where do you get your mama fuel because you've been through some wild ride yeah Um, um get your fuel now um for myself (laughs) <laughs> first and foremost mm-hmm. which is a miracle um and something that I never thought I would be able to say I need time alone mm-hmm. I didn't want to be alone because I didn't want to think now I'm good with it I have to do that is it thinking or is it is it feeling because it is. It, do you know what it is it's being it's not doing it's not doing anything it's being just in the chair intense Mm-hmm. And the first time, the, like the first three seconds were hell, so I stopped. And then it was like, the, you know, 30 seconds. I was like, I can't, this is ridiculous. I've got so much to be doing. And now it's, it's not negotiable. The more I don't want to do it, the more I'm going to do it. So I just do it. So being with myself, reading, not being online. Mm-hmm. I used to be everywhere. Everywhere, 24-7. wasn't a notification that I would miss. Mm-hmm. The quicker you get out of there, <laughs> the better. Mm. There's no requirement for anybody's job to be all over social media 24-7. Nope. Just don't. Just come back here to the reality, the present. We don't do that enough. We're just so busy living up something else. So coming away from social media was a big um, thing for me. Sharing what I think on social media has been huge. Mm. I didn't believe that anyone, that's not right. I didn't believe that I should share my voice, that I shouldn't speak, that I shouldn't talk about it, that I should just be quiet. What was the risk for you? 
I don't know, judgment. Um, if she's felt like that, then there's clearly something wrong with her. Does she even know what she's talking about? You know, is she making this stuff up? Does she mean it? Is it truth? Is it, you know, everybody talks about honesty and integrity and all that thing. You'll never hear me say it. I just write. <laughs> and I was afraid to do that because that's just being me, being, being who I am publicly. It, then what's the risk? People don't like it. I don't know. I don't know what the risk was. The risk wasn't, it wasn't external for me. It was, it was mine. It was, I was going to be somebody completely different. Was I ready for that? I didn't really care. Step forward wholly yeah. yourself. Am I ready to be me? Because mm. I wasn't in 2012. I didn't want to be <laughs> anything like <laughs> what I was. Didn't want to feel, didn't want to read people, didn't want to hear people, didn't want to, just didn't want to. Um, so being who I really am on social media was not for anyone else's benefit. It was, I was avoiding it for myself. I didn't want to be that woman. And now I like her. I like her. She's not amazing. She's not perfect. She's nothing. You know, she hasn't got something that someone else hasn't got, but she's entirely me. Mm. and I don't mind if you don't like it scroll on past I don't mind if you feel the need to message me and tell me I don't need to respond Mm. I'm good with me and it's taken a damn long time to get there (laughs) Mm. but I would say that you've gotten there a whole heck of a lot earlier than other people do maybe maybe um yeah because it it requires the courage and it requires a a willingness to look at our frailty and to to just go, mm, yep, okay, this is me, yep. So and to answer I'm- your question in a better conclusion, what fuels me? I live a life that I love. I only do what I love. I mean, all right, I don't. Sometimes I've got to wipe my kids' bums, and I don't love that. But you know what I mean. I don't force myself <laughs> to do work for money, which is what I used to do. Mm. I do work that I love now and the money comes anyway. So I'm going to tack on a cheeky question then because there will be mamas listening to this going, that's fine for you to say. I'm here alone with my 17.6 children and my university debt or my someone who has, I, I have a dear friend who's, yeah, she's on her, she's really on her own. And so there isn't, there are some, there are realities of life. So it's, sure. it sounds idyllic to say, I only do work that I love because you can. Because I can, but believe me, I had to let go of work that I didn't love to get to the place that I'm at now. I have had to make choices. I've had to create this life. It wasn't gifted to me. Mm. nobody's given me any money nobody provides for me you know my husband didn't work for four years I was the sole breadwinner I chose to take the risk of letting go of the work that I didn't love fully aware that maybe it would never be replaced by anything that I did love that it might have been the biggest mistake that I ever made just flushing a business down the toilet because I didn't love it why would anyone do that I'll tell you why, because it doesn't make me feel good. And I trust that there's something way bigger than me and that that's what we're all allowed to tap into. And I trust. And the proof proof is in the pudding. (laughs) The proof is there. You are living the life that you want and happy and doing work that you love. And your kids get to see mummy going to work delighted because she loves it. And that is such a great gift to them. And my kids look and, you know, people, people who don't believe in homeschooling are obviously in our lives. It's, it's people don't agree with everything we do all the time. And they'll say to my children, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? And sometimes the answer might be, I want to be, um, Charlie's classic is I'm going to be a paleontologist. (laughs) Just like every eight year old. Um, Yeah. And the standard people go, that's not a proper job, Charlie. You can't do that for a proper job. My answer is mummy doesn't have a proper job either. Whatever you want to do, if you want to do it enough, you'll make it work. My children believe that. They don't believe in limitations. They don't believe that they're not capable of doing something. They don't believe that they're not clever enough for a certain kind of life. Mm. They know because they watch what mummy does 
that they can create whatever they want. And it's not, there are not, believe me, there are days when I sometimes think, oh my gosh, this is too much. Or, you know, there are days when I don't like it and I don't love it and I'm tired and I just want everyone to go away. But they're rare days. <laughs> yeah. You know, most days are good days. Most days feel good. And my children expect their life to be like that. I would say that means that you're winning on so many, so many <laughs> fronts. I hate, I don't like to say fronts because it sounds like a battle, but it, yeah, I'm celebrating you, celebrating you for, for having that courage. And I know so viscerally, truly in the true sense of viscera, what it's mm-hmm. like to be in that, in that, those dark places of panic and to see that you have had the courage to, and it's funny, it's an Australian friend and mentor of mine who talks about the elastic band, that you have this, your, your, in fact, I have an elastic band on my desk that I can really <laughs> reach and share with you. Um, if I could just reach behind my soundproofing cushion, my super savvy, my complicated, I can't. Anyway, I have an elastic band because Tash said to me, and she was one of the, my earlier interviewees on the podcast, Natasha Benzetti, I think she's episode seven, that when you have this elastic band, you can stretch it and then it comes back. Yes. But then if you keep stretching it, it starts to stretch wider and it'll come back. But the more you stretch, the bigger the elastic can get and the bigger it gets and the bigger it gets. And so your comfort zone gets bigger and bigger. You stretched it pretty darn far getting on a plane and going to Australia with your family with panic attacks. So, wow. Um, but you have, you have had the courage to do it on a physical plane. You've had a chance to do it on the courage to do it on a, on a career plane. You have had the courage to do it on a mothering and, and schooling and bucking the system plane. I mean, that is, that's like courage, 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 courage. And as you say, the life that you live right now, where most days are good days, which is all any of us want, right? We all yeah. want to be happy. That is something that you have created and then trusted and then created and then trusted and then created and then trusted. Even if it was- I leapt every private. time. Yeah. Really. Sometimes it took me a lot longer to do it than others, but I did it anyway. Well, I think that is such a brilliant place to stop. I'm celebrating you for taking those leaps. Hurrah. And thank you for sharing your heart and your experiences and your beautiful, courageous soul with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's been lovely. Bye-bye. Bye. That's it for today's episode of Mama Fuel, the podcast. Thanks for listening. There's a lot more conversation, sharing, and real mama talk happening in our private Facebook group. To join us, go to www.thecenteredmamaproject.com forward slash Facebook and make sure you say hi when you get there. If you like this episode or if you know a mama who could use a little mama fuel, I'd love you to share this episode and to rate and leave a review. Every comment helps and it is always a delight to hear from you. Thanks and bye for now.